Okay, uh, let's start the ball rolling. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Nimrod, I'll be your host, your moderator for this webinar. And I'm a senior learning advisor at James Cook University, Singapore. I'd like to say welcome, all of you, to our uh, panelists, our panel speakers, to our audience, students, teachers, educators, lecturers from different universities, wherever you are in the world, welcome uh, to this webinar. We are very happy that you could join us today. Uh, the title of our webinar is finding our sense of self in a time of crisis, implications for education. Indeed, uh, I would say that this pandemic, this COVID-19 pandemic has, has had a monumental impact on our lives. Uh, we have been asking ourselves burning questions, probing questions, questions ranging from pragmatic to economics to public health to the psychological dimension and to our fundamental beliefs and values in life that allow us to make sense of, of our existence, of who we are as human beings. So to the, to the students who are here today, thank you for coming over. We know that many of you are faced with the difficult challenge, not only in terms of managing your online learning experiences, but also in terms of dealing with existential questions questions about meaning, questions about meaning making. And uh, I think these questions have come to the fore, especially during this time of crisis. So as you struggle to find answers to these questions, don't forget that we are around as your teachers, your lecturers, and uh, we are ready to engage you in meaningful discourse. Uh, as teachers and lecturers, we are not only facilitators of learning or co-creators of knowledge, but also as people with the capacity to inspire you. And I hope, I believe we are, we are, we have been inspiring you in your, in your academic journey to reach your goals, to make a difference in your lives, to appreciate things that matter in the midst of disruption. So without much ado, uh, I'd like to welcome you. Please listen, reflect on our sense on your sense of self, perhaps. Uh, Type your questions on the chat or on the Q&A button, uh, questions uh, that you have in mind while listening to the speakers, questions about uh, academia, questions about the life world. The main question that our speakers will be answering today is what makes life meaningful for a learner and a lecturer in a time of crisis? And uh, before we begin, I'd like to uh, go through some housekeeping rules. Uh, this webinar will be recorded for publicity reasons. Uh, put your microphone on mute so we can hear the speakers clearly. Type your questions in the Q&A and uh, please take note that Q&A will happen after all the speakers have presented. And for technical issues, uh, for those who cannot hear me or cannot hear the speakers, use the chat function to inform uh, the organizers. Okay, I think, uh, I hope Chris is now with us. Uh, we are joined by Professor Chris Rudd, uh, our Deputy Vice Chancellor uh, at James Cook University, Singapore, to welcome us to this webinar. Over to you, Chris. Yeah, thanks, thanks Nimrod. I hope people can hear me loud and clear. I, I'd like, first of all, to congratulate you, Nimrod, and the organizers for putting together such a, a great panel. And actually, you can see the impact already by the large and highly diverse international audience that you've drawn. So a big congratulations to, to you for that. So I, I, I think you know you've you've you found a theme that really resonates with what people are thinking about right now. You know, we we're still living through COVID. Um, and that's one, one dimension of the problem, I think. You know, we've all been through this big journey of, of self-discovery. And I'm really proud, you know, on today of all days, Teachers Day here in Singapore, of the amazingly rapid response that the, we made here at the James Cook 
university here in Singapore in terms of supporting our learners so that their, you know, their degree programs were not interrupted and that involved colossal efforts, not just by the teachers, but by everybody who was supporting that mission. And, 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 and I would place our learning center here in Singapore at the very heart of that support mechanism, but, but also supporting our, our staff because it's not just students who have had to undergo change and, and very rapid change, but, but many of our staff as well, um, supporting them to acquire the new skills, supporting them from a welfare point of view, separated from their families often, um, many of them living alone here in Singapore and, and helping them to get through some of those often quite dark and, and lonely times. And, and then again, you know, supporting those who are ha having to operate at some distance from our operation here in Singapore and teaching classes, at, you know, in the middle of the night when they're in different time zones and so on, all un hitherto un unheard of challenges for the sector. But, you know, we've come through and we've come through, I think, with our reputation held high and with our satisfaction ratings from students, I think also maintained at a high level. We've heard even, even a few moments ago in our Teachers Day celebration here in Singapore. And, and just before I, I finish Nimrod, I just want to say that, you know, there are multiple dimensions to this, to this question. And we, we think very much about our own circumstances as we, as we live through the continuing cycle of, of COVID-19, but also let's think about those learners who are trying to continue with their daily lives in, in war zones, living under repressive regimes, and, and all of the privation that, that, that goes with that. And, and, and so I, I think even as the world responds to recent events in Afghanistan, it, it's a sobering thought that, you know, despite the hardships that we are putting up within our respective domains, there are many people who are under, undergoing greater privation, greater challenge in, in continuing their, their learning journeys either as learners or as educators. And, I, and, and I'm sure that the panel will want to reflect on, on some of those issues. So thanks for the invitation. I look forward to, to hearing the discussions very much. And I hope that everybody manages to take something of value away to assist them in their ongoing challenges. Thank you, Nimrod. Thank you, Chris. Uh, that is Professor Chris Rudd, our DVC at James Cook University, Singapore. Uh, I agree, uh, Chris, uh, JC is living up to the challenges, multiple dimensions. I'm looking forward actually to listening to the speakers, uh, them trying to really cover, discuss these multiple dimensions uh, with regard to the overarching question for today's webinar. So thank you so much, Chris, for the words of inspiration as well. Uh, I also would like, we also would like to call uh, Professor Abhishek Bhatti. Uh, uh, Professor Abhishek is our Dean for Learning and Teaching and at the same time our Campus Dean for James Cook University, Singapore. Uh, Abhishek, over to you. Are you there? Yes, Nimrod, and thank you for the invite and, and the opportunity to speak. So first of all, a big thanks to the panel. I guess uh, we do have an illustrious panel and I am just as everyone else is eager to, to hear from, from this, this wide range of perspectives that our panelists would share in the next, uh, the next session. Um, coming back to the title of, of, of this webinar, Sense of Self in Time of Crisis, it's, it's just amazing. And how in this current era of, of distributed education, if I may say so, where, you know, we have moved away from a model where education could be consolidated in, in let's say, certain buildings called campuses or, or learning spaces, learning hubs. And now there are there's so many range of, of variables across the globe, some of them that Professor Rudd highlighted uh, just moments ago. And, and not just that, but even the, in this, this, this VUCA world, if I go back to my, my, my favorite phrase of, you know, uh, of, of so much uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, which is, which is there at the moment, 
how does academics and how do students are able to make the most of, of, of this, this academics through the teaching and students through their learning experience. Uh, and I guess the, the panel here and, and uh, looking at the number of participants, we are going to get to close to 200 participants soon. So I think that the conversation will be very rich with the panel's perspective as well as uh, some uh, interesting questions that will open up new perspectives from the audience. So once again, I congratulate you, the team, and of course, my, my thanks again to the panel uh, uh, to come together and, and, and to share their thoughts with us. Back to you, Nimrod. Thank you so much, Abhishek. Uh, Professor Abhishek is our campus dean and dean for learning and teaching at James Cook University, Singapore. I also heard about the VUCA world. I, uh, I think it will be, <laughs> it will emerge somehow in the discussion today. Uh, yes, thanks for the words of welcome. And uh, without much ado, I think we need to, I think all of us are very eager to listen to our speakers uh, who, have, who are from different backgrounds and who have you know, uh, indicated their interest to, to talk, to, to speak uh, with us today. But before that, I'd like to call Dr. Caroline Wong, a senior lecturer uh, at James Cook University, and at the same time, our Associate Dean for Learning and Teaching, to introduce our speakers for this panel. Caroline? Thanks, Nimrod. You hear me okay? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, a very good afternoon to all, wherever you might be, and uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce our panel of speakers. Joining us today is Professor Stephen Naylor. Uh, Prof. Stephen has been an active participant in education, learning and teaching and the creative arts for more than 40 years. He has taught in various educational institutions and for the last 25 years worked in the university sector receiving a National Carrick Institute citation for outstanding contributions to student learning in higher education in 2007. He has assumed roles of leadership in each sector, driving curriculum, um, quality assurance, policy development, staff management, professional development, assessment strategies, and research agenda. Currently, Stephen is the chair of the academic board of James Cook University and serves on a number of boards, including the advisory board for TESSA panel of experts in Australia. And as a board member, he provides expertise on governance, contemporary art in the global context, and a strong understanding of both community art and art training in tertiary education. So welcome, um, Professor Stephen Naylor. Next, uh, we also joined by Dr. Paolo Di Rio. Paolo received his PhD in classics from the University of Pennsylvania with a dissertation on St. Augustine and Plotinus. Ever since he has been focusing on the Platonic tradition as well as phenomenology, particularly the thought of Martin Heidegger. Since 2013, he has been lecturing philosophy at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. Welcome Paolo. Next in line, we have our very own Yen Cameron from James Cook University, Singapore. Yen holds two master's degree. One is Master's of Arts in Cross-Cultural Communication and Applied Linguistics from the University of Newcastle upon Time. And second is a Master's of Arts in Philosophy and Psychology from Edinburgh University. Yen has worked for nearly 30 years in English language teaching and learning. After a number of years teaching in Europe, followed by South America, he has primarily worked in Asia, moving into management and successfully started and ran a new English language teaching center for a multinational organization in Singapore before moving on to run teaching centers in Spain and then Sri Lanka and eventually returning to Singapore. Now, as you can see, you know, Yun has, uh, is really very uh, global uh, in, in that context. He's focused now on programs which prepare young people for the English language demands of tertiary education, particularly at university, as head of department of the English language school at JCU Singapore. Welcome, Yen. We're also very happy today that two of our current students at James Cook University can join us at this panel discussion. 
Uh, first, we have Pax, uh, Paxton Neo, who's taking his Bachelor of Psychological Science at the School of Social and Health Sciences at James Cook University, Singapore. Paxton served as an undergrad psychology research assistant to Dr. Chan Kai Ching for phase one, two, and planning of phase three for a research project titled A Database of Time Lapse Discussed Inducing Visual Stimuli. Paxton has served at the Singapore Police Force and is a relief allied educator at ACS, Anglo Chinese School in Singapore. Last but not least, we have Michael Dare from JCU Australia. Michael was born and raised in Townsville, North Queensland, Australia, and he has been living there for 20 years now. Currently, Michael is taking his Bachelor of Secondary Education, focusing on Japanese and geography as his areas of teaching specialization. He is the president of JCU Education Student Society at JCU main campus. He's also currently employed within the hospitality industry as a barrister and he considers himself a professional photographer. He believes that becoming a teacher is a game changer because teachers can make a difference in students' lives and help them shape their future. So welcome, Michael and Paxton. Okay, over back to you, Nimel. Thank you, Dr. Caroline Wong, our Associate Dean for Learning and Teaching at James Cook University, Singapore. Without much ado, I really would like to uh, give uh, the, the floor to our speakers. And to begin with, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Stephen Naylor. And I believe I am going to share your slides, Professor. Yes, okay. thanks, Nimrod. Whilst you're I'll, getting those up on screen. I'll um, do it now. Okay. Look, well, welcome everybody. It's uh, it's a great pleasure to be um, to with, be with you here this evening. I'm um, coming from the Bebagoo Yamba campus in Townsville, Australia, um, from the James Cook University uh, main campus, I guess. And um, I, I wish I was in Singapore with you all. I um, I spent uh, uh, four years there um, prior to uh, Abhishek taking over the role of campus dean. Um, next slide, thanks, Nimrod. Look, I, th I think what we're faced with today uh, is a cacophony of issues. And if you look at the media, you will see that uh, there is so many things that are uh, taking away, I guess, privileges, rights, experiences that we have been so um, assured that we would have had in the past. Um, however, what I would like to present with you today is that that learning uh, is, is a multidimensional uh, experience. And even though I haven't been in the, the lecture hall for probably more than a decade now, I always consider myself to be somebody who is trained as a teacher and have a huge um, appreciation of those people who taught me. And not all of them were teachers or lecturers. Some of them were friends, family, and I think that we have to really look very broadly at our learning experience. Next slide, thanks, Nimrod. Um, I guess we have to also think of, of the grounding elements in our lives. Um, it could be a lot worse. Um, Chris Rudd mentioned that uh, there are places across the planet at the moment that are facing far more challenging times. Uh, imagine being in Afghanistan at the moment. Imagine being in India or Indonesia where um, COVID is, is, is quite rampant or in Africa or other developing nations. These are places that are going to be uh, severely hit and the education experiences are going to be manifest on many of the, uh, the young people who are at uh, learning institutions at the moment. However, we are blessed to a certain extent having 20th century uh, technologies and um, healthcare systems that have made dealing with COVID uh, much more um, practical than it would have been, say, in 1919 um, with the Spanish flu. Uh, certainly in Singapore and Australia, we are blessed with a, a, a stable government. Now, it may not be the government that we would like to have. However, 
uh, there is a degree of stability. And I think there is a, a kind of a rational uh, approach to dealing with this pandemic. The other thing that makes it possible for us to deal with a, a pandemic like this is that to a certain extent, um, many of us who have, have a, a degree of education know what to expect. We know that things will be bad. And certainly in Australia at the moment, we are probably at our zenith in terms of the uh, number of people affected and the inability to control the Delta strain. However, we do know what to expect as we roll out vaccinations uh, across the nation. We do know there are vulnerable groups that we need to deal quite specifically with. Um, and, and we have to use the, uh, the various government uh, instrumentalities that we have at our disposal. Fortunately, education is one of those uh, elements that is going to really aid us. And I think the other thing is that all of us can look towards a better future than what we're experiencing at the moment. So look on the bright side of life. Next slide, thanks. Um, the other thing to remember is that these crises provide us with opportunities. And uh, it also means that some people who may not have um, been able to express themselves in a great way in a normal time, under crisis, you, you, you have a different opportunity. Churchill was a classic example, a fairly average politician who, who came to his, his kind of foremost in a crisis moment. And these elements are things that we have to look at. We will learn through being challenged. And this, this, I think, is something that we need to harness. Um, I think the other thing is that certainly if you've been involved in lockdown, you've had the opportunity to slow down somewhat and contemplate what your future is, not be swept up in the tide of what's happening around you, but actually start to think about you as the main strength and what your contribution will be. Next slide, please. I think this idea of what's really important is crucial. If we think about uh, classic philosophical thought, um, it is disruption that often creates a point where rupture spawns something new, where we are exposed to one way of seeing the world and through an intervention of a disruption, we are liberated. It can make us feel incredibly vulnerable or unsure, but what it does do is it makes us grow in some way. I'm a great fan of the work of Deleuze and Guattari in terms of their concept of us only growing when we become other, we become something more than what we believe we can be. And that is, of course, through a, a, a kind of a, a decimation of the standard who you per, the person who you think you are and starting to take on board other attributes of those that are around you and things that are around you. So I'm hoping that this crisis does not leave us a decimated nation, but rather a group of people who can see new possibilities, who can harness the energies that we have developed during this particular pandemic, and maybe deal with some of the existential crises that are facing our planet at the moment. So I'm looking forward to speaking uh, on, the, um, on the panel later on. So back to you, Nimrod. Thank you, Professor uh, Nader. That was uh, Professor Stephen Nader, uh, our chair of academic board at James Cook University. Uh, I was taking down notes while listening to you. And at this moment, I'm, I'm going to stop sharing your slides. And uh, I was able to at least write down one question. And I'd like to invite the audience really to be, to start typing your questions now on the Q&A section, uh, I believe our speakers would be very happy to answer your questions. So thanks, and thanks for sharing that quote, uh, Professor Stephen. Uh, disruption allows us to find a new reality. Uh, let's think through that. Let's think about that. And without much ado, uh, let's move on to Dr. Paolo Di Leo, uh, a philosophy lecturer, a philosophy senior lecturer at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. Over to you, Paolo. Hi, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Nimrod and Caroline, for inviting me uh, to this interesting talk. And thank you for everybody who's attending. 
Um, my take on the question will be uh, a bit more general, I fear, but uh, I hope is going to be at the same time essential. First of all, I want to uh, clarify two things about the way I understand the question or the terms of the question, namely uh, the words learner, uh, teacher, and then the word crisis. Regarding the first two words, I would like to say that to my mind, a teacher is also and is always a learner insofar as one is a teacher. That's because one never stops learning and the activity of teaching is in fact, or at least has been for me, a way to learn uh, more things and to understand better what I thought I already knew. So in this sense, the learner and the teacher are on the same path. Regarding the word crisis, uh, it is true that in the past two years, almost two years, we've lived in a, in a very difficult time, which has challenged many of our previous habits, uh, ways of doing things, and even maybe our ways of understanding our uh, social life, our being together. However, crises are not just moments of exception, like the present one, to my mind, but all life, in a way, is a crisis. If we take the word crisis for what it actually means, that is a moment of judgment, moment in which we're called to a decision. Any moment of life is a moment in which we are called to take up certain decisions regarding ourselves, regarding our bearing, in life and regarding our standing in the face of uh, the various situations that we have to confront. This uh, being said, I will go to uh, what to my mind is the answer I would give to the question. What is the meaning of education? And uh, uh, what does it mean to be involved in the business of education? For me, the business of education is mostly that of uh, walking together, the learner and the teacher, on the path towards freedom. Now, this word freedom might sound uh, horribly vague and uh, at times even empty. What does freedom mean? Well, on the one end, freedom is the main characteristic of the human being. The human being is the, is the only living thing that is capable of freedom and that not only is capable of freedom, but carries freedom with itself almost as a burden since the moment of its birth. But to substantiate even more this concept of freedom, which based on what I said just now is uh, something inescapable for whoever deems himself a human being, I wanna uh, add a further consideration, namely the link that freedom bears with truth. And in order to show you the, the, uh, the inevitable link between these two concepts, that of freedom and that of truth, I wanna refer to the myth of the cave uh, by Plato. I think none above you needs much uh, elucidation regarding what this myth says. I will go through it very, very uh, quickly then. As you know, uh, Plato in the 10th book of the Republic, uh, no, sorry, the seventh book of the Republic, uh, talks about uh, a bunch of people who since their birth are uh, forced to sit in front of a wall of a cave, being chained through their neck in such a way that they cannot turn back. So the only, see they can, the only thing they can see is this wall in front of them on which shadows of objects are projected. Now, actually, these shadows are shadows of objects that 
uh, are uh, carried behind them on top of a wall, behind which wall there is a fire. The light of this fire creates the shadows. Now, Plato says, it just so happens that uh, one of these inmates, let's call them, is freed by chance. And naturally, it turns back. It turns back and it starts leaving a seat. It is then that he realizes that the shadows or the images of things he had been seeing on the wall and which he, like his inmates, deemed to be the real things, the true things, well, these shadows are just shadows and they're the projection of objects which now for him are the real objects. But going further, this guy realizes that there is an upward path that would lead him to the opening of the cave. So going up there, he realizes that in fact, up above, there is an entire world of things which are visible thanks to the light of the sun. At first, you cannot see them very well because of the brightness, but once his eyes get accustomed to it, he starts seeing them. And then he fully realizes that even the objects that he had recognized on the wall are just copies of these real things that is now seen up above. Now, of course, in the Platonic, uh, um, framework, uh, what Plato is describing is the distance between uh, opinions uh, which are unbased, which are uh, unfounded, opinions that instead have already a greater foundation in reality, the objects on the wall namely, and finally the real things which for, for Plato are the ideas. What interests me about this myth is that this path through which this inmate is uh, brought to uh, be in touch with the actual truth of things is also at the same time and inextricably a path towards freedom. The inmate becomes free for real the moment he knows the truth. Now, this knowledge of the truth and this acquisition of freedom give him an obligation, which is that of going back and telling his inmates about what he, what he has seen. The result, as we know, is tragic because Plato says, much probably these uh, people, his former companions, will even try to kill him because he disturbs uh, the comfort of their acquired beliefs. What is this to say? This is to say that the path to truth is at the same time the path to freedom, as I said. And as a path, it is not simply the acquisition the uh, passive assimilation of notions, ideas, concepts, beliefs that are given to us, be, be it even in the educational systems. This reflection, I think, is particularly important in our time, which, to my mind, about all in the past 30 years, has been marked by a transformation of the educational system. The educational system in the past 30 years has become increasingly a training aimed at market needs and hence a training for employees, for functionaries, and so on and so forth. Sorry, there's my dog that always uh, goes up when uh, uh, the door bells. Uh, so the struggle and the task, the struggle and the task for each one, sorry, let's wait a second that it stops. Okay. The struggle and the task for each one 
as an educator and as a learner is that of always asking for all the assumptions, all the received notions and ideas which lurk even in the sciences, be they the hard sciences or the humanistic sciences. Only if the educational system manages to do that, can it then be true to itself and be for real that place in which freedom finds a sort of oasis and a place for its further development and for even more daring, ever more daring conceptual elaborations. And with this, I stop. Thank you. Oh, uh, Dr. Paul <laughs> uh, I, I feel like I was listening to, to your lecture. You know, I was imagining a huge lecture hall, listening to, to a lecture of, uh, you know, a philosopher. I have taken down notes. Uh, I also like the way when I was listening to you, especially when you were telling about the myth of Plato, that story, that story gave me a lot of vivid imagery, of vivid, Im vivid imagery in my head, trying to place myself somewhere else in that cave and uh, what's happening. I really would like to invite the audience to be asking your questions. Whether your questions are practical or philosophical or theoretical or methodological, please. I think this is the best way for us to really have a very meaningful discourse uh, in this webinar. Uh, I'd like to quote, to quote Foucault, who said that discourse is a system of possibilities for the creation of knowledge. Listening to Professor Naylor and to Dr. Paolo Di Leo, I believe you have some burning questions in your head about freedom and truth and, uh, and uh, a lot more. At this point in time, I'd like to call uh, Ian. Ian Cameron is, has also a background in philosophy and currently the head of the, of the English School at James Cook University, Singapore. Over to you, Ian. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. As you know, I'm, I'm Ian Cameron. I'm the head of the uh, language school here at uh, James Cook. Uh, which means that I, I run what we call the ELPP, uh, the English Language Preparatory Program. It's a, it's a nice name uh, because it tells you exactly what it is. Uh, it's a program, uh, no surprises there, uh, which prepares students who need to improve their English language skills uh, in order uh, to study here at uh, James Cook University, Singapore. Uh, they go on uh, and uh, study uh, whatever it is they choose to do. Um, uh, I'll, I'll pause there and emphasize that word, uh, choose. Um, uh, I'll come back to that later because choice is an important part of what I've got to say. Um, uh, so that's me. Uh, and, and as uh, uh, head of the uh, uh, ELPP, you may wonder what I'm doing uh, talking to you here about this question. Um, uh, I have to go further into my past and uh, referring to uh, Caroline's introduction, as you know, uh, from her introduction, uh, and this is before COVID, before Zoom, before even the internet, or well, before the internet was widely used and not that old. Um, my undergraduate degree was in philosophy and psychology. So I've always had um, a thing uh, for pondering about the meaning of life, uh, and I feel quite at home uh, in the present company. Um, so uh, let, let's jump straight into the, the question. Uh, the question, what like, makes life meaningful in a time of crisis, uh, particularly for, for learners and lecturers? Um, uh, that's a big question. Uh, and what a crisis. Uh, it's um, it's the biggest thing that's happened uh, for years uh, worldwide. COVID descended on us 
uh, spread and ran roughshod through everybody's plans and routines. Uh, everything has been affected. Uh, work, uh, social life, uh, travel, sport, entertainment, and, and of course, uh, education. Uh, there isn't an area of life it, it, it hasn't affected. Uh, and for young people, uh, particularly for young people who have uh, so much future in front of them, uh, the uncertainty it's brought is enormous. Uh, questions like, what, what, what will happen? What will I get a job? Uh, what's the point of doing a degree if I don't know what the future holds? Will I be able to study? Am I studying the right subject? What's the point in studying when I'd rather be playing League of Legends? Ultimately, why bother? Uh, when life can be derailed so easily, um, what's the point? Uh, what, what is important in life? Uh, what gives my life meaning? Uh, and my answer, uh, my answer comes straight from the existentialist playbook. What gives my life meaning? Nothing. Nothing makes anyone's life meaningful. Nothing except that person themselves. Uh, what we choose to do, and that's that word again, choose, uh, can give our life meaning, uh, but there's no real point in looking for it out there. I feel I need some support here. Uh, so I'm going to wheel in uh, a big gun, uh, perhaps the biggest gun uh, in, in existentialism. Uh, and he's right here behind me. Um, uh, that uh, is Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, and Sartre, uh, one of the biggest names in, in existentialism. Uh, He wrote a lot. <laughs> uh, it was very prolific, um, and it's quite hard to summarize uh, his his philosophy, his his take on things. Um, but uh, I'm going to try, uh, and I'm going to use his words to do so. Um, if you want to get to the heart of Sartre's thinking, uh, the uh, phrase um, that perhaps uh, does it best uh, in uh, three words: uh, existence precedes essence. Existence precedes essence. Um, that's all very well, but what does it mean? I interpret this uh, as meaning that we are before we are anything. In other words, we aren't inherently anything. Uh, we become, we become something, we become whatever we are through our actions. Uh, and because we don't have an inherent essence, uh, we're fully responsible for what we are. Uh, we can choose, and again, there's that choice thing again. We can choose, there are a lot of choices, um, but with that choice comes responsibility, uh, and we're responsible for, for, for everything. Uh, similarly, the, the, the meaning that we give our life, uh, it isn't out there, it, it isn't given to us, uh, we give it, uh, and that meaning is something that we are responsible for. Uh, so again, responsibility. Uh, and I think that chimes in uh, uh, with uh, what Paolo was saying about freedom and, and how freedom can be a burden. Uh, choice, it, it, we think of it as a good thing, but with choice comes responsibility. Uh, and that responsibility uh, can be a burden. Um, it's all very well, uh, and that, that, that phrase, essence precedes existence, the idea that we make ourselves through our actions, that we are not uh, given what we are, we, we make it. Um, but how does it apply to the life of a, of a lecturer or a learner? Where, you know, let's get practical about it. Uh, how can this choice and responsibility help us to deal with COVID? Um, I, I, I don't have a magic bullet for you here. Uh, existen existentialism isn't going to solve all your worries and woes and, and, and anxieties, um, but uh, existentialism does have uh, quite a history of dealing with crises. 
um, perhaps most notably uh, the catastrophic events around the uh, the Second World War, uh, and it it was um, it grew certainly and was strongly influenced by those events. Um, in response to crisis, uh, existentialist thinkers often uh, respond uh, with with the term of engagement. Um, engagement. My interpretation of engagement is. Um, it's, it's, it's giving your life meaning through action, becoming engaged, taking action to make your own life uh, meaningful. Uh, and I think there's a, there's a lesson for us there uh, in dealing with the COVID crisis. Uh, that response, uh, in response to crisis, engage, do, think, act, become uh, part of that meaningfulness. Um, we need to accept that we're ultimately responsible for what we are, what we do, uh, and that our choices, and we make a lot of choices, we make choices about wearing a mask, we make choices about going out or staying in, uh, we make choices about traveling, uh, we make choices about what we study, uh, we make choices about what we buy. Um, all of those choices are, are essentially free choices that we make, uh, and they have, they initiate uh, a chain of consequences. Uh, and those consequences and, and the, the, the choices that we make, um, ultimately, uh, we are at the end of that. We hold the responsibility for that. Um, as lecturers, as teachers, as educators, uh, one of the most important things that we can do is to inculcate that sense of, of, of freedom, uh, freedom to choose, uh, but also the responsibility that goes with that, uh, the people that are, uh, that we are um, walking the path with, the people that we are uh, educating, need to feel uh, feel free to choose, but also in that choice to realise the consequences of their choice um, and to make their choices uh, in the light of that. Uh, I think uh, if we can do that, uh, if part of our education uh, the education that we impart uh, includes that uh, it will help it will help uh, students to feel that there is meaning in life uh, it will also help uh, i think uh, with issues uh, issues that for example stephen mentioned uh, the, the 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 other crises which are going on in the world uh, to engage with those and to engage with the, the, the COVID crisis itself gives meaning to life in itself. Uh, and if we can do that, we can say that we have salvaged something, at least something meaningful um, from the disruption uh, and the disruption, uh, sorry, destruction uh, of COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh... I, I didn't realize all these uh, discussions that we're doing here are becoming, are getting more philosophical. But uh, well, personally, I'd like to say uh, we need this. We need this kind of conversation. We need reminders. We need to be listening to these philosophical ideas such as, as existence precedes essence, the power of making a choice how freedom can become a burden, uh, how we can engage, uh, the freedom to choose, and that freedom of choice uh, comes, you know, comes that sense of responsibility. Uh, again, I'd like to really invite the audience to keep uh, typing your questions in the Q&A. And uh, I believe we have we have spent a significant time listening to the voices of, of our lecturers, our educators uh, in the field of learning and teaching, uh, Professor Naylor, uh, Dr. Paolo, Mr. Ian. At this point, we would like to also listen to the voices and insights of our students, our student voices who are here today. We'd like to really invite Paxton and Michael to share uh, your answer to the question, what makes life meaningful? to a learner. Can we begin with Paxton and uh, Michael Palo? Over to you, Paxton. Right. Thank you, Dr. Nimrod. Uh, hang on, just let me share my uh, slide. <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you so much. Hang on. Uh, okay. All right, can you guys see my slide? <laughs> okay. So, um, hi everyone. My name is Paxton. Uh, first, it's a, it's a great honor and a privilege to be here on this panel today. A uh, big thank you to JCU Singapore and also to the uh, Teaching and Learning Working Group for well, giving me the opportunity to share. And also, yes, happy Teacher's Day to all the teachers in this chat at the moment. Uh, so, what makes life meaningful for a learner in a time of crisis? Uh, for me, I have two answers, though it may appear very similar to Mr. Cameron's answer earlier, uh, but it's from a learner's perspective. It's from my perspective and something that I actually personally went through myself uh, during the whole COVID crisis and the whole circuit breaker lockdown that we had in Singapore. So, yeah. So the simple answer is, again, yes, Jean-Paul Sartre's, uh, yes, there is no meaning or purpose of his life other than what his freedom creates, which in short is, well, the meaning of life is life itself. So for people, for you guys to understand what that actually means, and in my context, uh, let, me introduce to, let me introduce to all of you, me, pre-COVID. So who I am pre-COVID, or who I was pre-COVID, uh, I am a person that, of course, I, I've been born and raised in Singapore, 24 years of my life, through the whole uh, Singapore education system, uh, in a traditional, not really traditional, but more Singaporean Chinese family. Um, we always been somewhat implicitly trained, I guess, like what uh, Dr. DeLeo actually mentioned earlier, by our education system, that it's more of a, there's a mode, a particular model of success, you know, that in Singapore, what, what do you do to succeed is of, you get a degree, get a job, settle down, have children, have a house, and you know, yeah, your life's done, Bob's your uncle, in that sense. But, you know, it's, that, that's the mode that we had. That, that's why I had pre-COVID as well. And of course, the snapshot of me pre-COVID was that, you know, I was a second year psych student. Uh, in, we, we have a trimester system here in James Cook, Singapore. So um, we try to, it is, it is very challenging. It, it challenges us, it pushes us to our limits. And uh, of course, it sometimes for us, especially for me at that point in time, it got really draining. But of course, I just put it in the afterburner and just really um, try and, you know, just go through the routine I, of just like, you know, having a holiday, then back to work, back to school for three months, then back to holidays again, then back to school. It's, it's just a driving routine. I had, at that point in time, I was more grades driven. Uh, that's why when some of my lecturers back then, when they told us, you know, hey, you got this assignment to do. Uh, my first question would not be, hey, wow, this looks interesting. What can I engage with? How can I engage with the materials? More of our, most of me and probably my peers, we have this particular idea that we'll probably ask the lecturer. So what, what do I need to score? I, I'm not looking towards, you know, we, are, we, are, we were not really looking towards the joy of learning because joy and learning to us is like, it's, it's a very big juxtaposition of things at that point in time. You grow, you grow more and more cynical at over time, sometimes especially. But um, we try to, you know, just basically get straight to the point. Studying is a means to an end type of situation. It's very utilitarian, or at least that was for me back then. So, um, but of course I was already, I had a few things that was not going too well for me in terms of academics. I was formerly in the Dean's list, fell out of it, um, but I just kept moving on, just kept working on it. Um, I, I wasn't expecting too much. I'm a type of person that I just, as long as I can fulfill that so-called mode back then, the Singaporean mode of success, um, that you know you, you have everything smooth, you have a degree, that's good enough for me. I wasn't striving to be a millionaire or something like that. So that, that was for me uh, something that's very simple. And that was what I was expecting. And also pre-COVID, um, my family was, uh, in terms of relationship-wise as a person, uh, I rely a lot on stability in relationships. So my family was stable. My, I had a girlfriend back then, so everything was stable. So clearly, in, if you look at the, Singapore mode, the Singaporean mode of success, I think I'm pretty much halfway there, just minus the academics part. Of course, get a degree, then everything else should be smooth. But one critical flaw that I had back then was that if you ask me, what do you want to do next? One week, I can tell you, yeah, maybe I should try out with uh, maybe uh, forensic psychology or something. But the next week, it may vary into, say, HR, because... I, back then, I didn't know what I wanted to do. It was ambiguous. 
it was very ambiguous. Uh, I just left it open and pretty much deal with it by not dealing with it at all. So, and for me also at the same time, career was really way too far for me. And COVID really came at, I would say, uh, or a really poor time in a sense. But anyway, so in summary, what I was back then as a student, uh, pre-COVID, was that I was getting increasingly demotivated. Um, but of course, I was keeping it under the covers and still just trying to get uni done with. And um, don't really have a clear goal in mind, but just you know, see how it goes, that situation. And But of course, at that point in time, I felt, hey, at least I was getting the relationship part right. Or so I thought. So then moving to COVID. Um, when COVID lockdown came or the circuit breaker lockdown came in Singapore, um, for me, if you want to look for an example of Murphy's Law, so basically for those of you who don't know what Murphy's Law is, uh, Murphy's Law is that for things that can go wrong, it will go wrong. So for me, it's a classic case study of Murphy's Law. Everything went wrong. Uh, my academics, it slid because I really started questioning my own motivation. I didn't know why I was studying anymore. It was a point whereby, because we had to transit from face-to-face -face education, which was basically for me, most of my life, we have been studying with a lecturer telling us in a classroom setting into say a home-based learning setting, which was, you know, you really need to be very motivated about it. We, I, I struggled with the transition a lot. And plus you're locked in your own home with your own family. You think it's fine, but the problem is once you get stuck in there, I'm sure most of us have probably have went through that. Uh, once you get stuck at home for too long, those tiny little gaps or cracks that you have, it becomes giant holes that really, it becomes a big problem and your relationships start to have issues. So naturally, relationships having issues, yes, that happened to me with my partner then as well. And we started like, I think, uh, I think one of the earlier speakers actually mentioned also that, you know, in COVID, it makes you rethink whether do you know what you're doing. So that was exactly what happened. Um, my, my partner then felt that I didn't know what I was doing. I, I agree. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and I started questioning my own life goal in the end. What is the point of doing all these things? Um, yeah. And then, of course, everything just basically descended to the low point whereby I just felt like a husk an empty husk, empty shell of a person questioning why I'm even doing something. Why am I even doing what I'm doing? Why am I studying psychology? What is the meaning of life, really? Then it, 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 it was tough. It was a very, very low point. Uh, and of course, you know, you, it really brings up, when, it, when you climb back up out of this whole ditch of a situation, uh, it really somewhat how do you say, highlights the importance of, you know, the friends, having friends, having mentors, having family, something which you don't really understand, you don't really tap on for uh, in normal times until you really hit uh, the rock bottom and you realize, you know, they are the people that are there to help you. So that was one that I really learned the hard way that really no man is an island. Uh, we really had to lean on them. Sometimes you just need to ask for help. You're not alone in this crisis, but you really need to ask for help. And of course, climbing back up, that whole process was tough. I'm, I wouldn't say I'm fully out of it. I am still learning. We are always learning as uh, Prof, uh, Prof Nailor actually mentioned earlier, I think, uh, that you know, we are always learning. No matter who you are, at what stage of your life, you're always learning. You're always a learner first. And so that's what we are. That's why for me, that's what actually got me out of it. And also looking beyond the grades. We, it's not just, in education, it's not just about grades. I mean, as much as you know, yes, it determines your future. It determines um, a lot of things. Of course, your job, what, what can you do ahead? But really, it's more to train your mind. Train your mind to think, to cope with challenges that life throws at you. It's not just, it's not even due to your work anymore. It's beyond work itself. It's more about how you can cope and think for yourself and define who you are as a person. Um, and that's what really drives me every day in a sense that looking beyond the grades in itself, education is a training for me as a person. It's like a gym as a for a person spiritually in the sense. So one of the key takeaways that I have is uh, well, pretty much well summed up by the next slide that I have as well. This was actually told to me by a rather elderly gentleman. Uh, back in my younger days in primary six, in basically when I was 12 years old. 
uh, coming from a school that uh, isn't too good in Chinese, to me, this whole thing, this whole bunch of words just means be a good kid, learn well, and, uh, you know, be a good man and take care of your parents. Yeah, back then, that was me. But um, let me just read the Chinese to you. Or in English, basically, learning precedes talent and living precedes experience. Which, after this whole debacle that I had, the whole conundrum, it really sank and really hit me where it hit. It really, really, it really centered me quite well because it is true. Your, our talents, our ability to think doesn't come naturally. It's something that we have to learn. And we, it's, ne it's never ending. It's never something that you know, stops after a certain time. You continue to learn no matter what. That mold that we put ourselves in, in terms of, say, the education system, the success, that we, it's a false choice that we put ourselves in. It's not a real choice that we actually have. Um, so, of course, that more is easily to be abandoned, and I think that will actually help us with our learning. And experience-wise, experience kind of varies. It actually helps to build up a person more than just, you know, academics in itself. And so that's why another thing that I learned very well is that, you know, clearly you have to own your own narrative. The, the whole Singaporean mod module or model of success that we've been somewhat implicitly brought into and brought up with is not the end all and the main game is not it. It's something that we should, you know, abandon and build up our own because we have our own lives. We are individuals with unique strengths and we should play to our strengths. And of course, the main important thing is enjoy the process because it's not the ending that matters. It's the process that actually helps to build you to who you are. And so that's my longer, more complicated answer as a learner to the main question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Buxton. And thanks for sharing some slides. Uh, uh, I was listening to you. Uh, two things that uh, remained in my memory. One, uh, the Singapore mold. Be a good kid, get a degree, get a better job, settle down, have children, confront old age. And well, thanks a lot for the courage to, to actually challenge that Singapore mold by telling you know, your fellow students right here today, your fellow learners to own their own narrative, you know, make, create their own narrative. Uh, and to end our session today is our last speaker uh, straight from Australia, uh, similar to Professor Stephen Ayler. That's Michael Dare. Michael is taking a Bachelor of Education in uh, James Cook University, Townsville. Michael, over to you. Thank you, Nimrod. And also thank you, uh, Carolyn, for this amazing opportunity as well to be a part of this panel. Um, so just quickly, uh, yes, I'm a Bachelor of Secondary Education student at James Cook University here in Townsville. Um, my two teaching areas, as we pick teaching areas when we decide to do this degree, uh, is Japanese and Geography. Um, now, before I begin, I do want to mention that everyone has been affected by this, uh, by some degree of this pandemic, and I recognise the global impacts that it has on everyone, everywhere. Um, now, I wish to share my story before I begin to introduce my understanding of the question as it sets a scene for comprehension for the panel members and anyone watching. Um, so as we know, I've born and raised in Townsville 20 years of my life as it is. Um, I'm a barista at a cafe, so very, um, very minute, I guess, position. Um, I'm studying to be a teacher um, and I also consider myself to be a professional photographer as well. So for me, I tend to put myself into a position of new experiences so that I can gain new perspective and can communicate with different people, understand new culture and build connections. Uh, as a language teacher, it is vital for me to uh, experience new things as it helps me develop a sense of awareness of these different cultures. I was intending on going overseas to Japan to study um, in my third year. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, I'm still in my third year <laughs> uh, due to COVID. Um, and you know what an experience that would have been. Although unfortunately, six days prior to leaving, I received the email from the university saying that, well, hey, look, we can't send you because of well COVID. So I definitely know what it feels like. Um, now I really have the time to think philosophically, so I might take that practical approach. Um, I'm so caught up in the now, and topics such as this aren't often discussed uh, as it comes down to the interactions I have with my work colleagues, um, my friends, my family, my university peers. That influence the time that I can put aside for this. Uh, as there are many aspects of a person's life and asking oneself what makes life meaningful, uh, I've broken it down um, 
to being a learner of language and pedagogy, a teacher of geography and Japanese, and as a leader of the Education Student Society, as I am the president. Uh, I have a charismatic persona, almost requiring face-to-face -face verbal conversation, uh, sorry, face-to-face uh, -face social interaction for success in lectures and with assessment tasks. I'm much rather physical face-to-face -face learning than online learning for certain. Uh, and I feel as though I retain more knowledge from a verbal conversation than a scripted email reply. The feeling of seclusion and being stuck behind a computer screen, for me, I believe limits the authenticity of human interaction. And I guess even though via Zoom as we are right now, where facial expressions are visible, there is a lack of connection for all parties. So for me personally, in terms of what makes life meaningful for a learner and a lecturer in a time of crisis, I believe it comes down to the physical and social interactions and the feeling of experiences that one used to be able to gain outside of their own home, um, as we are bound by the confines of our own home. Now, uh, for some of those psychologists out there, Vitskotsky's sociocultural theory, I learned a bit about him in my uh, first year education course, um, teaches us that uh, social interaction with family members, peers, teachers, and general community, community is critical for the development of a child. Uh, and I guess ourselves as adults as well, it's, it's a continuing thing for us. So this face-to-face -face interaction within the classroom is an element we've all been missing for the last 18 months, some even longer. For me in Australia, it's been for the past 18 months. However, even with lecturers striving for the return to campus uh, to better the lives of their students and themselves as individuals, uh, limitations implemented by universities and government policies still make it difficult to reignite the old ways of learning we were accustomed to and what we enjoyed. So I guess for us as youth, <laughs> Um, early 20s, I suppose, um, you know, your late teens to early 20s is supposed to be the social pinnacle of our lives. Um, this is a time for us as young adults to develop a sense of social independence, to, to leave the home. However, young adults are constrained by this pandemic uh, in not allowing us to achieve social independence and a sense of self uh, through integration into society outside, you know, the confines of the family unit. Even now, students who have graduated high school uh, have never experienced university life or culture. And I can certainly say it takes a toll um, on my members who are a part of the Education Student Society here at JCU and Townsville. Um, it makes it very hard for them to share their ideas and perspectives and knowledge about their lives to further learn more about what it is to be, I guess, a social collegial um, group of people. So while technology has aided us in being together, it takes a pandemic to help us realize that interactions via social media and online streaming platforms do nothing more than create a sense of alienation and not helping our mental well-being. I have definitely taken a toll on with that. My biggest crisis has stemmed from this pandemic, not being able to go to Japan. It was a two-year plan for me. Um, however, because of colleagues, peers and friends, I, have, I was able to interact with, I persevered through a period of poor mental health. As I was surrounded by a strong support system, you know, however, for people in other countries and in other parts of Australia, they were and still are not able to access the support that I had. So from this, it, it, comes, it, it has become clear to me that meaning stems from sharing our knowledge, perspectives and ideas to educate others. Um, education and social interaction, I believe, are what makes life meaningful. Being educated stimulates the mind, motivates the soul, and can benefit an individual by getting to think outside the confines of what they are used to. In a metaphorical sense, it can help us guide them outside the walls of their own home. The social interaction brings us together as a community, no matter where we are. I have friends all over the world, Japan, Norway, everywhere. <laughs> um, and with the help of technology, I feel interconnected despite its limitations. Uh, so that's all I have to say, um, short and sweet, I guess. Uh, however, I did again want to thank Nimrod uh, for facilitating this panel and for inviting me to uh, this amazing discussion with all you members. Um, and I guess to sharing our thoughts on what makes life meaningful for a learner and a lecturer in a time of crisis. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for a very practical uh, approach in answering the question for this webinar. Uh, your social interactions uh, framework uh, framed within the social cultural theory is something that I think a lot of students can relate to. <clears throat> and uh, I really would like to appreciate the presence of our students who are here today who, who had the, the courage to, to actually speak and share their experiences, their insights about, about the question. I believe we have a few questions uh, in the Q&A. Uh, and uh, can I just, and I think the questions are also ranked based on likes. 
Uh, so I think the first question is, is very open. <clears throat> and the first question is long, but I just would like to, to summarize that because I believe our speakers, our panelists can read that. Uh, the question really here is uh, from, from Yong Chun C, who was commenting about online learning, freedom of access to, to internet, the, the online and the online and distance learning. Uh, Yong Chun C was, let me move this one, was asking, with all these online learning that is actually happening right now with the pandemic, I'm sorry, I just need to stop sharing. The question that he or she is asking is, is computer or is the internet world a prison? What I choose to access, what I find end up being the same few things I have been. So the question is how can students find meaning in an online world when everything appears mainly the way you want it to be? How do you open online learning such that people are engaged meaningfully? How can, how do we define, how do we achieve or accomplish this meaningful learning in an online world? I think he used that kind of, you know, that, that illustration of computer as a prison. Uh, anyone would like to answer this question? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take it up. I think it's an interesting point. Um, and um, I think it's kind of two points that there, there's kind of the idea of interacting through digital means remotely, we, we lose quite a lot. Uh, and we lose options, less is possible, a lot is possible, but less. Um, so we have to function within that. Um, that's something that essentially we choose to do. And we choose to do it because uh, if everybody carries on as normal, COVID spreads more, there are drastic consequences to that. So we're, we're making an active choice here, uh, and it's a choice for good reasons. Um, within that, uh, and I think I have to have to bring uh, Jean-Paul back in again, um, he, he, his idea of freedom um, included the idea of uh, uh, someone in a prison cell is still free. They still have minimal, if you like, they, they have choices. Uh, they have choices about um, uh, who they are, what they do, uh, and those choices come with, with, with responsibility. It's quite a difficult concept, the idea that restriction, even in restriction, we are still free. Um, but uh, and it, a little bit technical, and I think we, we could apply it here. Within um, the, the online environment, we're, we're limited. Um, but uh, still within the, we, we still have choices. We can still, um, if you like, um, express ourselves, uh, take action, engage as far as that's possible. And through doing that, uh, we, we gain a certain amount of freedom. Uh, when it comes to actually uh, the, the teaching element of things, uh, I think it can be, especially in, in the initial move to uh, remote online learning, uh, teaching uh, or being taught by a face on a screen uh, rather than a real human being, um, we do lose things. Uh, however, um, that's what we have, and we have that. Um, and uh, I think, as Stephen said, you know, uh, if this had happened 20 years ago, what would we do? We do have something. We've got a lot more than we would have had. Uh, and um, we we have to see that as a, as a good thing rather than seeing what we're losing, look at what we, we can retain. Um, and, and, a lot, and a lot can be done. Uh, not sure that entirely answers your question, but I hope it addresses it at least. Nimrod, if I can jump in there, I, I, I think ahead. it's really That's triggered right. a number of, of key points. Um, I think probably uh, one of the things that, that provided me with a, um, uh, an opportunity to expand my knowledge base when I grew up, and, and I grew up in a small country town of 3,000 people, um, you know, relatively isolated back in the 60s, 
And uh, the lifeblood that, that really expanded my knowledge was, was a book and the radio. Um, we had television uh, for about, you know, from about three in the afternoon till maybe 10 o'clock at night. So television wasn't big in those days. But, um, but books and, and radio were, were the great insights. And, and I think that every opportunity that we have to be exposed to a way of expanding who we are and, and that, that point of provocation that I talked about, that, that you know, we, only, we only grow when, when we're disrupted from a kind of a, a status or a stasis where, where we, need to, um, we need to build in some way, we need to expand our, our way of seeing the world you know, this, this idea of becoming other, um, you know, if I can become more like Ian or Paolo, I will be a better person because just as me being me, I'm, I'm limited in my understanding. So by listening to somebody else, uh, that's, that's the whole purpose of teaching. And, and whether or not you're, you're you know, in, a, in, a, in an olive grove in, in, in Greece listening to, you know, Plato and Socrates and, and, and the various... Uh, great philosophers of the past or whether it's listening to Foucault or you know, Deleuze or, or whoever, um, you're going to be expanded. But it's, it's about disrupting that sense of I'm stable now and I don't want to grow. You know, we, we, have to, we have to be placed in a point of vulnerability. And if it means being educated through the internet for a small period of time, then that might allow you to grow, it might allow you to understand some new things. I also have some real big questions about the internet too, because it is an unmediated uh, form. Yes, if you're logging on to your JCU um, uh, you know, teaching um, learning management system, you will have a curated learning experience. And that curated learning experience may be an online experience or it may be a face-to-face -face experience, but it will be mediated through curriculum, pedagogies and the various uh, interventions that we have in terms of good governance of our teaching practices. However, you also have the right to jump online to a MOOC or to go onto a website or to engage in Wikipedia. And as a discriminating learner, you will learn that there are certain sites that will give a perspective that may not be mediated through uh, data. It may be mediated through opinion or the volume of people who believe in that particular area. So for instance, in Australia at the moment, we are having marches about people who don't believe in vaccines. Now, I, I'm quite happy to, to have a discussion with those people, but the data that I use provides me with an insight that the vaccine was much more, um, a, a, better, a better way of, of dealing with this than not dealing with it. Uh, so, so, you know, that, that's something that I took on board. Um, I think what you have to keep doing is, is challenging what it is that you're hearing and use as many different uh, methods, techniques and sources to ground truth those areas. And this probably means you've got to be much more agile in your learning you're not just receiving information from one source. You really are in a position where you can actually curate your own learning experience. Um, so so don't, don't think that this is a lesser experience. In many instances, it's a greater experience than we've ever had in our learning experiences ever. Now, this is the point at the moment where you have more options than ever before. And the likelihood that you will appreciate face-to-face -face learning in a in a lecture theatre or in a workshop or in some field work, probably means that you can bring this experience and add it to that experience that, that you've had in the past. So high quality learning might take place in certain situations. But one thing I can guarantee is that not all learning that you experience during your education in primary, secondary or tertiary is going to be beneficial to you. Some bits will be more beneficial and some bits won't. And sometimes it's not what you learn in the lecture theatre, it's what you learn outside of the lecture theatre where you apply some of those uh, pearls of wisdom that you're given. So, you know, think very broadly about these experiences. 
Uh, and I guarantee that you'll have something to talk about in a decade's time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Professor Stephen. For, for that uh, uh, response, uh, would anyone else would like to add to that conversation? Uh, I would like to add something. I think actually he just clarified that, you know, it's more of like becoming a more algorithm based type of scenario. Uh, like an echo chamber where you're just getting shown things again and again and again. Uh, so, I mean, what I feel about that is actually that sometimes then in this case, how do we break free is to really maybe encourage more face-to-face -face or even more say, not, not really face-to-face, -face, but more personalized our conversations. So this is when, you know, really your social circle, talking to people whom you are somewhat, you know, who are in the same boat as you, interacting with them would actually help more um, as, you know, in a sense that it breaks you free from the algorithms. And as well, you get to exchange views at the same time with uh, your peers as well and support each other. So in a way, online is a matter of perspective. It can be a prison if you allow yourself to do so. It's a choice, but if you were to say break out of it or you and your friends would make use of it to try and maybe help improve your learning experience and maybe discuss and work towards a particular goal, you can break free from the algorithm. Yeah, that's my view. Thank you, Baxton. As uh, Ian mentioned a while ago, a uh, prison can still be free. Being in prison can mean that you're, you still, you know, experience that sense of freedom. If, actually, if I, if I can add to that, Nimrod, uh, I spent, um, uh, through misadventure really, uh, I spent almost four months uh, isolated in the UK, um, waiting to take up my post here. Uh, mm. And the uh, the computer for me was was anything but a prison. Then uh, mm. it was a, it was a key to the outside. It was my communication. I had zooms with friends. Uh, we had happy hours together. Uh, we did all sorts of things. Um, it, it is kind of relative, uh, mm. and I think we have to we have to look at it from that perspective. It's a great enabler in many ways. It needs to be carefully used, um, but it, it it does provide uh, a great many things. I, I'm a great fan of face to face interaction. Uh, don't get me wrong, but um, uh, it, it, it is there is there's a lot of perspective in there, uh, and and digital communication uh, mm -hmm. is a great enabler in many ways. Thank you. And uh, yes, Paolo would like to, to add I'd like to that. To add something about this. Of course, I agree that uh, the computer, the the thing, the single computer, like mm -hmm. any other tool, uh, is good or bad depending on how we use it. A knife can be a great tool to cut meat and prepare a stew, or it could be something with which you kill yourself or others. Now, uh, this analogy, though, is not completely correct. Why? Because the computer is part of a net. Each computer is part of a net, what we call the internet. And unfortunately, I think that the handle of that knife is not in my hands, nor in anybody's hands, at least not in the hands of people I know. What I want to say with this is that the internet for all it is talked about as an open space and so on and so forth, is in reality an enclosed space in which we are not given freedom. We're given the possibility of choices. Now, being able to choose among options is not being free. Or put in other terms, your freedom at that point is limited to the choice you are given. That's one problem. The other problem, which is not to be uh, underestimated and to which I don't think that the answer is the sporadical face-to-face -face contact, the other problem is that these devices are increasingly becoming tools for extraction of data based on which then policies by governments and by various powerful actors are established and uh, push on society at large. So it's a very, uh, to my mind, not only, not only complex, but in a way sinister phenomenon I don't have the answer on how to face this. I limit myself to uh, 
try to understand in all its depth the sinister and complex nature of it. Um, yeah, that's what, and yeah, another thing that I may want to add, uh, well, of course, indeed, in this past two years, we've been in this situation, but I don't see any reason why once the pandemic is over, and I hope that will be very soon, mm -hmm. things shouldn't go back to normal. Why we should be stuck on this kind of interactions, I quite don't get it. Uh, if we keep being stuck on this kind of interactions, then I dare say there is something fishy going on. But with this, I stop. Thanks. Thank you for your for your thoughts, uh, Paolo. Anyone would like to react to that, or if not? maybe to continue our conversation is, because I think we've heard so much about the internet, the online learning space, uh, possibilities, opportunities, the analogy of prison and freedom and so on. I don't need to add to that, but I think there is one good question here about what if. Uh, there are so many what ifs uh, in the mind of perhaps students right now. And I think to expand this question is, what kind of what if questions should students be asking and why those what ifs? Because many, there might be a lot of what ifs, but maybe if our speakers can share what, a few what if questions that, that, that matters to students' lives, to their learning, to their existence, maybe that's going to be eye-opening for, for a lot of them who are here today. Can anyone start you know, the conversation about what are these what if questions we should be asking ourselves and why those what ifs? Well, if I can, something that I think didn't come clear enough in what I said in my talk, in my contribution in the beginning. A what if question, to my mind, could and should be, what if the educational system keeps steaming towards this being geared, being aimed at market needs. What if the educational system becomes even more so a training ground for employees? At that point, will there, very, will there uh, really be the possibility for an education at all? Or we're gonna just be facing a world in which schools of various degrees and various levels become just places not of freedom, not of pursuit of truth, but just of production of academic stuff when referred to the teachers and the researchers and production of employees when it comes to the students. This is something that has been in my mind now for a long time. The first time that I heard and I I became aware of this problem was many years ago when I was still a PhD student in the United States. And one professor of Italian literature, Professor David Brownlee, in a, in a casual conversation we had during a, a departmental uh, party, told me, look, you cannot know this or you can know this very vaguely because you're too young, but universities didn't used to be what they are now. Universities have increasingly become, and now at least in the US, he was telling me, are totally places in which academic stuff is produced, in which academic little logos to stamp on any and everything as prepared, are prepared. But they're not what they used to be, those places of knowledge in which knowledge was created, disseminated and shared through really a sense of community and a sense of belonging to a common enterprise. Professor Brownlee back then was already 70 plus years old. So he was talking of probably the forties. So what if our educational system keeps going in the direction in which it has been going in the, in the past 30 years? What's gonna happen then? I know for a fact that this discussion is being brought up 
in various uh, European journals. For example, the last one of the last issues of the journal uh, Noises in Italy focused exactly on this. And some contributors were even suggesting that maybe the arts, philosophy, the humanities in general, all those sciences that push the question of meaning on any human activity, all these sciences will have to migrate somewhere else, will have to find other spaces. But what are those spaces gonna be? Are there gonna be such spaces? I think, at least to me, this is a very urgent and uh, disquieting question. Thank you. It also, the, the, your questions are also making me think even deeper. What if? Thanks, Paolo. Uh, anyone would like to add to that? Or anyone would like to ask another what if question? I, I, yes, think, I, think, I think the, um, the what ifs are those things that uh, are really a valid point of, of education. And um, you know, I absolutely empathize with, with Paolo uh, when I was at, at Melbourne you know, back in the late 70s, um, having these conversations over booze and drugs and goodness knows what else we, we all did in those days, um, thinking about what the world was like. And it's about envisaging a future. And this is, this is the great challenge. You know, I sit on the executive of James Cook University and we contemplate these, these issues. We have uh, supply, demand, we have um, policy by, by our, our government, we have demands by our students, we have pressures by employers, we have a, a cacophony of, of issues that we deal with. But I think everybody around that executive table believes that knowledge is central. And, uh, you know, whilst, whilst I'd certainly agree that there is a neoliberal approach that is, is not creeping in, but is, is probably running a great uh, percentage of tertiary educations nowadays, there's always a kernel that sits in a back room somewhere that resists and gets up on a soapbox now and then and pontificates about discourse and, and challenges people and, and looks at the consequences of, of what's going on. And those agitators are really important. And whilst, yes, there may be a whole lot of subordinate individuals who will deliver their curriculum, uh, produce great graduates who will become fodder for uh, you know, the various professions, there will always be those group of people. And, and if, if we go back in time, it was a small group of people usually whose minds were trained to a kind of an elite level of, of grappling with those fundamental questions. Um, that, that have always held on. Um, you know, look, I have seen vocational education take over the tertiary sector. There's no two ways about that. And it's about the value proposition that people are prepared to make in terms of paying fees for an education. Um, you know, if we were back in monastic times, uh, it would have been those families that were wealthy enough to send their sons off to you know, to become scholars, uh, you know, in, in, in the various uh, literary arts of those times. We have to protect, uh, you know, that, that, um, that liberal arts program. There is no two ways about that. And as an art historian, uh, it's so easy to tap into um, those lineages that, that have worked their way through various civilization, be they from the East, be they from First Nations, be they from the Western traditions, but we can often follow those and, and use those as ways of seeing where societies have blossomed and then contracted you know, into kind of uh, environments where, where it's not a good place to be. Um, you know, we, we, can, we can talk about the Renaissance and we can talk about a kind of a, a moment in time where where knowledge and power were, were, were at one point. But then we can also talk about the Second World War, or we can talk about, you know, the, you know, the Hundred Year War with Spain. You know, I mean, there's a, there's a million times where, where there's been a rupture in those areas. 
but we have to rely that there is something in every human being or every group of human beings that will want to push harder to understand the world. Um, but I don't think it's going to be everybody. And this is perhaps our challenge that now tertiary education has become something that um, is almost like a demand for, for being job ready. It's not really. Uh, it, you know, I, I think Paxton is quite right in questioning many aspects of what it is. And like I said before, it, it might be 10% of your learning at university, which is, a, which is actually going to make you a better person and make you make a difference in the world when you graduate. You've just got to really find that 10%. But you do need to envisage what the world would look like, um, you know, when you do graduate and try and move towards that, I think. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I have nothing else to say. <laughs> I was also learning, you know, through listening to you. Uh, I couldn't agree more to your explanation about how we can explore other what if questions. I, I also come from the liberal arts a framework, this lens and uh, I believe we don't need to, we have to do something to really preserve uh, liberal arts, the power of, of students and the opportunities to think bigger, to really see and envisage the future, to see that kind of vision for the future. We need people in the liberal arts. Although I would say in some corners of my country back home, that is somehow, you know, waning uh, with the advent of science and technology and a lot more. But I think we can do something to really preserve that, strike some balance, uh, invite young people who are here today to really appreciate what the liberal, liberal arts can contribute to making the world a better place. Uh, I have nothing else to say unless there is any other addition uh, from the panel, and we can actually ask one last question before we end. Uh, Michael, do you want to add something or ask a what if question? I did want to agree with you there, uh, Nimrod, in regards to how we need to, I guess, uh, entice people to learn the liberal arts. And because I, I noticed as an educator and as a teacher or pursuing teacher, pre service teacher, um, there has been a shift from those the science, technology, engineering, maths, the STEM side of things, more of a shift into that than there is in liberal arts. And I feel as if the, the power of learning is equivalent across the board, no matter where it be in, in STEM as, as, as a field or as liberal arts, as, as a sense of learning. And through university, uh, myself as a student, I wish to become a teacher of Japanese and geography. So I, I'm heavily for the, the, the learnings of liberal arts, but all education is important no matter what it is, whether that be science, technology, engineering, and maths, whether that be liberal arts, whether that be whatever it is that you wish to learn, learning is key, learning is important. And I think that even though university is one way to do it, there's also that conversation of, of uh, vocational education and training as well for those who wish to, uh, I guess, learn a more practical or physical on, on job uh, train form of training. Um, it, it is a very interesting topic to say the least. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Michael. I am very uh, concerned of time uh, and of course uh, the other priorities and other things we need to do uh, today. Maybe uh, to end this conversation is to focus on the question from anonymous attendee about finding the true self. Uh, what do we really mean by finding the true self? What is this true self? When can we say that it's true self? Mm. Maybe you have some thoughts about that. A lot of students may be struggling about this true self can be related to identity, who they are, but when can, what is this true self that they're looking for? Uh, and uh, when can they actually say that it's the true self? In what way? Any thoughts from our speakers? Yes, well, Paolo. If I can. This thing of the true self, as everybody knows, comes from the Socratic, uh, Socratic commandment, I would call it, or exhortation, gnosis afton, know yourself. 
which is what the god told uh, Socrates, right? By the way, this was inscribed on the on the front door of the temple of Apollo in Delphi. Now, uh, I think that there is there the possibility of a misunderstanding. Namely, this misunderstanding being that of having to find some kind of hidden substance somewhere, some kind of original version of what you are, uh, out of which then you are deviated for some reason, right? Or out of which life makes you deviate. Well, in truth, as Ian was saying, there is no self. There is no authentic or original version of yourself. There is just you living. There is something that unfolds, okay? Now, uh, where do you unfold? Well, you unfold in the society in which you're born, in the, in the history and in the stories in which you happen to be born, in the language in which you happen to be born into. And it is in, first of all, understanding, confronting, absorbing these realities as your given situations that you start becoming yourself. Socrates, for example, how, how did he conduct his research about himself? By talking to people, by going around and asking questions, by putting whatever he believed up to the, uh, up to the moment in doubt, and so on and so forth. And just to conclude, the philosopher that um, mostly to my mind shook the uh, 20th century and I think the entire Western philosophical tra tradition, Heidegger, he came up with this term that is much used, but I fear much misunderstood, the term of authenticity. One must be authentic, which is a fancy way to say one must be himself or herself. Well, what is this authenticity? We have to look at the German word, Eigentlichkeit, Eigen, Own. That is to say, you must own what you do, not what you are, because you are nothing. Without doing, you are nothing. Without making, you are nothing. You are each time what you make. So this search for the self is really the responsibility regarding our freedom in the situation in which we are, in the situation in which we are. The author that uh, Heidegger regarded as uh, an example of Eigentlichkeit, of authenticity, was Ernst Junger. Ernst Junger, as you may know, wrote his masterpieces, mostly uh, relating to his experience in the trenches during the, the First War. Now, did he choose to be in the trenches? Of course he didn't. If given the possibilities, possibility, wouldn't he leave the trenches? Of course he would. So was he not authentic because he was forced in a situation that he didn't choose? No, he was authentic. authentic. He was himself in each time because even in a situation that he didn't choose, even in a situation that he didn't want, he lived it, owning it, making it his own. So that's what, to my mind, finding yourself means. Not caving in into some kind of fantastic identitarian idea, be it the identity of a social group, be it the identity of a fantastical, phantasmagorical self that you have imagined, or the idea of a nation or the idea of whatever. Being yourself means to stand straight in front of your life and own it at each moment. I hope this brings some clarity. Yes, I hope so. Uh, Dr. Nimon, I would like, just like to add to Dr. Paolo's uh, thing. It's like, um, I, in a sense, yes. So that's what this is. It's very true that you actually have to, the best, the true self, in actual fact, is actually who you are every day. So you should, in a sense, endeavor to be the best, be a better version of yourself every day as you do everything that you do to improve yourself 
And with every day that that process keeps building up in itself, you somewhat, your true self is always the, the, the person that you are today. Whatever you do, you know, as you build it up, it gets better and better. And it's your own narrative and it's always you. It's never someone else. There's no benchmark whatsoever. It's always you. And so, yeah, in my mind, that the true self is who you are today and with each day as you move forward. Gives you freedom and enables you to find meaning, uh, which goes back to the question that we have been asking ourselves in this panel discussion. Uh, I have nothing else to say. Any final words from our speakers? Uh, I think uh, time is running out and, and it's... Any other questions? comments, additions, if not, uh, really uh, on behalf of James Cook University, we would like to, to thank you for your, for your insights, ideas, for your presence here tonight. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, please help us uh, with a, a very short survey. Uh, we would be very glad to, to actually know what you think about the, the topic for the day or even suggest uh, some other interesting topics for our future engagements. That would be very helpful. At this point, uh, I'd like to call Dr. Caroline Wong for some uh, closing uh, message to our audience. Caroline, over to you. Thanks, Nimrod. What can I say? You know, it was, or it is like, as if I'm at the Athenian Agora, listening you know to the sages you know telling me uh, stories about thoughts of the philosophers and i wish we could continue engaging in this conversation so i want to thank you on behalf of gcu singapore to all our distinguished guests and our fellow students for taking time out to share your thoughts your stories and also our audience you know for in a way articulating the fears and anxieties that they have right, and, and asking the existential questions. And I think this conversation will continue to, to be carried out you know, in our various uh, places of work uh, in time to come. You know? and, 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 I, and I'm glad that we brought this question out in the open and engaged uh, different thoughts, uh, different perspectives, uh, and different uh, way of looking at life uh, and existential question. You know, uh, from a business background, I often, um, you know, when, when you guys were relating about the various uh, questions about existence and so on, uh, I actually was thinking about the chaos theory, you know, complexity theory, where out of that little bit of chaos and disruption, that's when innovation comes about. Of course, here we're not talking about innovation. I, I think this is where, uh, yeah, we try to make sense, you know, like Stephen alluded to earlier about the opportunities uh, presented to us uh, to tackle what is to come, you know. Uh, of course, there's no right or wrong answer, and we are continuously working on this process uh, to make some meaning out of our existence. So again, I want to... Uh, you know, say a big thank you for uh, your sharing and also to our audience out there who have participated so actively. My, our apologies if we have not answered all your questions. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you, all right? If you have, uh, like Nimrod say, any thoughts about how else we can organize future discussions uh, and that will be our privilege to host it again. So back to you, Nimrod, thanks. Thank you, Caroline. Uh... That's that I think that concludes today's uh, web tonight's webinar. And for the audience, you, you can really scan this QR code. Uh, let us know what you think. Uh, give us some other ideas for future learning and teaching uh, discussion. Uh, we would gladly uh, think about that and plan for for the future. So we will be happy to learn from you to the speakers. Uh, to Professor Stephen Naylor, to Dr. Paolo Gilio, Ian, Cameron uh, Paxton, uh, 
Michael Deere, uh, what can we say? Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>